you know, they always seem to have to come from behind. They did have a thing where you can like, count them out, didn't they? Yeah. I was, I had something last night and then I, I was watching them a little bit and they were losing, but not by much. Yeah, it was a good game. My dad called me right afterwards saying that he was like really jacked up about it. Oh, you're probably from Philadelphia, aren't you? Yeah, yeah. so you you live and die by the Philly sports. Oh. It's funny too because people even ask me like, do you like basketball? And I'm like, well, I like the Sixers. I'm like, well, do you like football? It's like, well, I like the Eagles, <laughs> <laughs> you know? Um. Great. Well, we are recording. Thank you so much for coming down here and speaking to me. I really appreciate it. Uh, what I what I like to do just to sort of start something off, I've been trying recently. Uh, my my fiance has really been drilling this into me as to like prepare a little bit. So I, I started preparing and learning a little bit about you. And the first thing we saw was some video that uh, your favorite show is Chopped and uh, <laughs> an American Ninja Warrior Challenge. And I was dying because... My fiance's name is Juliana. I call her Jules, and we watch Chopped all the time. And so I watched this video. I was like, Jules, Jules. And I was like, her favorite show is Chopped. So oh we, had some, <laughs> we had something to start with. I can't get enough of that show. I know. I really like all of the, I like the reality shows the, with the competition. I mean, that's... That's what you said, that you liked the competition. Yeah, I love mm -hmm. Survivor. I mean, I don't watch it every year. I'm trying to watch it this year, but I keep missing it. So I started recording it. I told her to record the series, but I haven't quite caught up with cool. it. Cool. Yeah. So I didn't know Survivor was still playing. It's still going. God, what is that, like 15 years or something? It's at least, yeah. I Thank remember goodness. the very first one. So do I. Yeah, that guy that won was walking around nude. That was such a big deal. Yeah, yeah. Wow. He now they put have clothes on the whole Naked time. and Afraid. Uh, naked and Afraid is phenomenal, though. You know you love that show. I do. <laughs> I don't need him to be naked, but it's... It's what they go through. But I, you know what? I was saying something to someone the other day about Naked and Afraid and that they put them in such horrible places. You know, really they, do. they if you're going to survive, put them in a place where they really can find food and mm -hmm. that they're not they're not, uh, you know, in the middle of Alligator Alley or lions and tigers. You know, it, it it's uh but it's a great show. But I feel like you, you just have to be prepared to not eat for 21 days and to get bitten up to the point where, you know, it could. I mean, I wonder and, and I know in the past that people have been sick. You know, they don't tell you sure. that part where people are sick for months mm -hmm. from all the bites that, that they uh, got while they were there because we're not used to that. Yeah, we're not used to having hundreds and hundreds or thousands actually of different kind of insect bites. Yeah, I, I really agree, though. It feels like it's almost what's the term like shock value yeah. a little bit more than it's actually like a survivalist show it's kind of like let's just see what kind of torture we can put these yeah. poor people through to see if they can make it for 21 days and i you know it's funny because i'm you know we have so many lizards and iguanas here and i'm mm. always amazed that you know eat the damn lizards <laughs> you know eat the of iguanas do but i think a lot of people think that they can go 21 days without eating and you know th rather than eating eating those type of animals uh -huh. um but you know there's so many snakes that that's definitely a good thing to eat but i won't i would never do it just i mean i would have done this years ago but i wouldn't watching it i wouldn't put myself to what they're putting themselves to it's, it's not i don't find it it, to me, you can't really say that person was a survivor. Was a survivor who exactly. ate, who didn't, you know, they lost forty pounds, and if, you know, if they were to stay there another twenty-one days, could possibly die. I totally agree with. They're what you're starving, yeah. yeah. So that I don't like about that show, and I really don't think they need to be naked. I just, you know, at it's least ridiculous. Yeah, <laughs> but you know, I, you know, I've I've paid attention to that show so long now that I don't even pay attention to Notice that it. and i don't think they do either i mean it's it's sort of like nobody even thinks about it anymore so um but you know i like i i'm always interested in the ones that come there and in 21 days they have made themselves clothing they have made themselves shoes mm -hmm. and hats so there are some people that go there totally prepared and i think that um those are the interesting ones the rest of it where they're just dying of they're just suffering. Uh, the yeah, whole they're time. suffering. I'm I'm totally, totally in line with what you're saying. It's not a survivalist show where you actually see um the skills and the techniques that it takes to like to not just make it, you know, not just like survive, but figure out a way to flourish, I guess. Right. You know, exactly to, to find a way to live your life and be relatively comfortable. Exactly. So you 
you were quick to mention the lizards and the iguanas. And uh, please correct me if I'm wrong. I read that you're from Key West. Yes. What on earth is it like to be born in Key West? In Key West? Because for people that are listening, Key West is like, you know, known as like a, a tourist kind of vacation place. But once you go there, it's really like a tiny, tiny, tiny little island place. Like you could walk from one side to the other. To the other. It's, I probably would say that it is the most unique experience when you grow up in a place like that. I, I lived literally, we lived literally off the water. Wow. When I, you know, everyone was a fisherman of some sort. And so, and most people were not, you know, didn't have a lot. We didn't have a lot, you know, it was just very working class. And unless you owned a business down there, you know, you were working for, you know, pay and, mm-hmm. and not very much. So, you know, we all relied on fish and, uh, I, I, I always say to people that I'm probably my family. There is really no heart conditions in my family well, from down the, there because they the ate diet. fresh fish. Yeah, the diet was so uh, different. And yet the my generation of cousins have had, I've had one cousin that had a stroke that's only, only a year younger, um, high blood pressure, things like that happen to be, become, I see in my generation but in like my mom's and my grandparents, not not one of them had heart issues. It's amazing. It is amazing. But it was, you know, the, the water was very clean. The fish was plentiful. Um, we didn't need a lot of processed food. Um, so I think it and but it was uh, and my father was just he was such an island person. You know, he I mean, he would teach us to eat from the island. You know, he would catch things we always had alligators for pets uh seagulls and he i wanted a raccoon so he built a a cage which of course he had wire on it so when we went out to the keys the next day it was it was eaten through oh yeah um which i you know of course my dad then looks at me and says so what did you really think you were going to do with this wild <laughs> raccoon and i was like keep it as a pet <laughs> but um you know so I, I you know my whole family was there well wow. going downtown on the weekends, you know, it was, you go shopping, you went down on Duval. Mm-hmm. Um, when the crest, where the crest was, it was a little counter. And all my grandmother and all the, the women would go hang out there, have lunch and just, you know, talk. It wasn't as, you know, with, with the snowbirds, you know, people didn't want their privacy. One of the things my grandmother always complained about, is she's like, when people move here, they put in these big fences. They don't, you know, they're not friendly. You know, there wasn't a whole lot to do, you know, dance, you know, everybody had their own parties so people sat out on their porches and you talk to each other you know it was just a lot more sociable um now you know you you see the places everything everyone has their privacy fences that are are rebuilding sure you know you never called anyone you just went you just showed up i mean it was it we always joke because you know if you had a if you had a boyfriend or girlfriend when you were young you had to go ask your grandmother to make sure they weren't family uh-huh. you know it was a very it was very um, tight-knit community it inside. was a very tight-knit community so sure. you know it's definitely changed and I, but not necessarily for the bad because you know it gave me the opportunity to have orchestra down there i do a lot of music ed the kids you know the, they go through all their schooling and they get music education through us they come to concerts we're doing that up here as well you know we've when I, we started out in key west and then we moved up to the mainland and so we perform in Boca we perform in Fort Lauderdale Miami and still in Key West and that was always the mission was because I grew up there and the one thing I didn't have was that kind of exposure to orchestra symphony you know really learning about the cultural arts and um but I wouldn't change it for the world I mean yeah. I I loved I loved you know every night we visited on Tuesday and Thursdays we went and visited my mom's one of my mom's sisters on Sundays we we went to have dinner with my grandmother I saw my grandmother every day she would keep this little box of uh, uh, almond joy or something one of those little chocolates mm-hmm. for me because I was on a swim team and I would stop by there and hey grandma you know and just ride my bike to the navy navy base where I was a, I was on the swim team yeah then they tell us that chocolates like lead in your stomach you. to stop eating that uh-huh. and, you know so anyway so it was you know i i saw my family i saw my uncles you know we just you you had family you visited your family yes um so i wouldn't i wouldn't change that but you know i i realized once i grew up that i didn't have those opportunities sure and so i'm i'm happy that 
you know, we're able to do that. It's a great orchestra. And um, we've really come a long way with the education that we do and, you know, are still growing. And so you uh, you, you jumped right into the orchestra and I'm glad you said the timing was perfect because I want to get a lot more into like the actual reason why we're here. Um, oh, I don't know. I like talking about Survivor and yeah, Naked yeah. and Afraid. It's <laughs> but, well, and and I'm glad because uh, you also it's so funny because I, I went out to dinner with two of my best friends and, and my fiance last night. And when we were waiting, um, we were talking about exactly what you just said, how I just mentioned that I'm buying a house and it's in Nashville and it's a little less like congested than it is in Boca. And I was talking about how um, I kind of like that because when I was growing up, like my neighbors and the, my neighbors across the street, like we we're all family and you could just go knock on each other's doors and sometimes even just walk in the front door. And, uh, my friend John said exactly the opposite. He's like, I grew up basically in the wilderness and there was nobody around. And like, I like that better. And so when you say that you're on the front porch and you see people walking by and then other people are talking about building up fences because they want their privacy, you know, like that, that makes me feel uneasy. And I'm, I'm way more, I don't want to mentality maybe is the word. Um, just like open community, kind of everybody, vibing and brushing shoulders with each other you know i like that so i i think that's that's really cool um you'll probably get that in nashville too you know when i lived I in virginia so. the southern you know they're still a little they still have that friendliness you know come anytime For sure. yeah so you'll enjoy that I think. yeah I'm, i i don't know enough about it to really like call what what the culture of the town is gonna be but i'm definitely excited so Man, you just said so much about living in Key West that I, I really wanted to dive into. And so I, I, I might kind of bounce back and forth throughout the conversation. But I, I, I really am admired or my eyebrows kind of popped up when one of the first things you said was education, especially when it comes to music. I remember seeing this TED talk about Victor Wooten. I'm, I'm sure you know he is. <laughs> he's, a, he's a bass player. And uh, he does this whole thing about music being a language. And he loves to educate people on the language of music. Do you do you see music that way? Do you see it as like a a thing that we need to learn, or a thing that we need to feel, or a thing that we need to express? Or I guess really what I'm asking is like, what did it mean to you? Uh, for me, I mean personally, it's a way of for me to express myself. Mm -hmm. um, I love the. I love the story behind the music. I love the history behind the music. I love the, you know, the intelligence of the music. You know, the the composer, the talent. You know, that com and um, the creativity. I love to interpret what I feel that composer is trying to get. You know, for us to see, and then make it mine, and then have the orchestra make it theirs. Uh, I think that. It is, a, it's its own language in that, you know, we all have to look at it a specific way. It's like, it is like learning. Like there's rules. Yeah, mean? there's like, it's like learning to read. You know, mm -hmm. you'd have to, you have to learn the notes. You have to learn the articulations. You have to get the technique in your, in your body or in your hands or your lips, whatever instrument you're playing or singer. And it's, it's, but it's all encompassing. I mean, it's everything. It's physical. It's emotional. It's mental. Uh, it's certainly, I you know you I someone that's never played a violin and was told to sit for two hours and play the violin and play the play what's on the music could not never do it. I mean mm -hmm. it's physically. I mean they're holding their like a violin muscle they're, memory. It's yeah. yeah they 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 have to build. You have to really build up to that. I mean, so you know someone playing a horn or oboe. I mean that you're using muscles that that um, you don't normally use. Oh, so you're saying they would fatigue. Yeah, they would. So. Yeah, they gotcha. wouldn't be able to to last. Gotcha. Um, you know, and then there's the whole mental part of it of you know concentration. You know, of of staying in the moment. We did a just recently the last our last concert for the season as far as our masterworks. Um, we did the Berlioz Symphony Fantastique, and it's a piece that's probably about 40, 40 some minutes, and it's but it's just so full of so many things, and and one has to just be really on top of it but you also have to be free enough that it expresses you know what he's saying and it's such a story and it's almost it's almost comical because i swear that 
if I were to play Symphony Fantastique for you right now, you would, the first thing that would come to mind is Halloween because it's really, you know, it's about it's about ghosts and mm-hmm. and rattling bones and I mean and, and he and how he uses the instruments to 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 get these sounds. And I remember people asking me, aren't you just exhausted? Because they said, I mean, you had to just stay, you know, you were just there for 40 some minutes, never, you know, never flinching, never losing your concentration. And, you know, I I think that's the part that's the most for me, the most amazing is that you know, it's not something you touch, but it's something that is there. It's and you communicate with that, and you communicate with the orchestra, and hopefully, the audience is feeling it. And that that you're all together, you know, that you're together for forty some minutes, and and you know, that you don't lose that. And it's it's happened where you know you can see someone loses their concentration and a mistake is made. But you know, it's it. But it's something that you know, as as you become more professional, you're in, and because you, most of us start it at a very young age. It's a discipline. It's a discipline like if an athlete. Of I mean, course. honestly, I, I when I've done children's concerts, I was out in L.A. doing runouts with the L.A. Phil. And I, you know, I found out some of the names of their great, you know, basketball players, football. Mm-hmm. And, and I compared the L.A. Phil to the sports team saying, you know, and, and in fact, most of these musicians, especially in the strings, have been playing that instrument since they were probably three, three and four years old. And that the reason that they are where they are is because, because they, you know, it's really important, especially in the strings piano that they started early age only because again, it's not a natural way to play. And so there's certain muscle developments that has to, you know, your muscles have to be developed so that they can play all these fast passages and reach the kind of reaches that they have to do. And, you know, if you talk to those that are really in the top echelon of um, musicians, most of them started at a really young age. For sure. I've, I've definitely noticed that. I, <laughs> okay. I have a question that I've always wondered, and I feel like I may be the only one who has noticed this, but I, I, I can't be. When you see a, a symphony and an orchestra and you see the conductor, you you think after all that practice, like how important is the conductor actually to be up there standing every and and I mean, I don't know if there's a word for this. I'm sort of speaking out of my ass. But uh could at that point is when when the show is going on, is all the hard work done or is like your role to lead everything just as important as it was for the preparation? It's the work is done, mm-hmm. you know, and I think, you know, if I I always think that what I get to do in the concerts that I maybe don't do as much in rehearsals is that now I get to be ex- as even more expressive. I can. So I'm just performing. It's I'm yeah. I mean and but the thing that a conductor does, I mean, it's funny. I mean, first of all, when you have an eighty some piece orchestra, you know, the w- woodwinds or the brass, they can't really hear what's going on. So they all do depend on the conductor. I mean, that absolutely and and what's interesting because that's that, so interesting to know. And 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 the but but even more so for me, I mean what's more interesting for me is the performance. We, Oh, I'll give you an example. Mm-hmm. I was at a years ago. I was at a um, sort of at a conducting uh, workshop, and people asked this. You know, what is the conductor's role? So they decided that they were going to put seven us up, seven of us up there, and we were going to all conduct exactly the same spot in Beethoven Seven, which is you know everybody knows Beethoven Seven. Every musician knows it. So there was nothing for them to learn. There was nothing different for them to learn. There was nothing different for us to hear. Seven conductors got up there and it was played seven. It had seven different personalities. That's so cool. And so I think for me, what I always feel is that it's what is the what is the energy? What is the color of the you know aura that I'm going to put out? What is how do I make everybody feel exactly the same way so that in some to me, it's magical and it's the thing you can't touch. For it, and and they know it. I mean, when I see my orchestra smiling, or we're all moving back and forth together. I mean, they're moving with me. You know, we're all dancing. Mm-hmm. I know that we've reached that that moment, and and it's about you know keeping it. And it, truthfully, if I were to break that, it would break it. And mm-hmm. they notice it, and they'll, you know, I can, you know, I can see if something happens if somebody breaks that, 
it affects the orchestra. So I think it's that it's that it's that mystery for me and that, you know, that's something coming for me, giving to them, but also then mixing with who they are of course. and creating and, and, you know, and conductors do we do create our we do try to create a sound that we hear uniquely. Ill. Yeah. Th- yeah. And in the last few years, I was really working on really solidifying the orchestra, getting people in right places. And I was just extremely happy at this last concert because I kind of felt like here we are. We've reached that top notch group. I mean, they sounded fantastic. I mean, I, I would put them up against any orchestra in this country and um, they were that good and, and, and you know, just so um, there and, and so happy. And they, they just loved working with each other. And, and the, you know, that's a good feeling. And when you know your musicians are happy, when they're excited, you know things went well because, you know, they do this every day of their life. So, sure. you know, if they get off feeling, oh, my God, that was wonderful. And, you know, you you know that your audience is feeling that way, too, because the audience bounce, you know, they get their energy from us. Mm-hmm. So when they're seeing the orchestra smiling at each other and communicating with each other and, you know, and they see them moving with me or me with them, because sometimes when I see things get to a place where, all right, I'm just going to ride this out. I'm going to sort of sit on the, I always say the magic carpet ride is like the orchestras reach it. Now I'm just going to ride it and let them, let them stay in tune with each other. And mm-hmm. I just kind of go with them, you know, it's just knowing when those moments you can do that. And, and, and something that I've noticed, especially as the orchestra has really been more, you know, that it's the same people over and over now, <clears throat> because we're really playing a lot now and have a much bigger season is um, that I'm able to, I, I can't let myself stay in it too long, but, you know, get to a place where there's, I'm almost in a trance and, and, you know, it's, it's almost like a swirling mm-hmm. moment. You're and, hypnotized. Yeah. And I, I can't stay in it too long because it actually, I think I always feel like I'm going to fall off the podium, <sighs> but, but that's something kind of new in the last few years that is, is, you know, I know when I get to that moment in myself, I, and like I said, I really can't stay in it because I think I will fall, yeah. but I know that, the orchestra that we've reached that place that, you know, we all strive to reach and, and, and give to the audience. So I'm finding that that's happening more and more with this group. And I think it's because we're not, we're playing a lot more together. We have a, you know, so it's very consistent and they know what they know my conducting. I know how they play, you know, it's just like getting to know somebody. So they, it's a relationship. They, yes, it's exactly right. That's so good to know. And I just, when you said that, I found it to be so refreshing because I think everybody loves music, right? There's something about music that is just human in yes, a way. It's human. Um, but, and I'm really just speaking for myself, but I've, I've seen that a lot. And I've always wondered if it's something where like a movie, right? Where like it's a production and you put the pieces together and then you wrap it up and like here, here's the package, which I'm not saying that that's bad, but. I guess there's something about live music for me as like uh, somebody who's played a lot of music in my life and who loves live music where I worried that you're losing like the spontaneity of what it is to have like a group of people feeling each other's energy. And like, like you said, communicating on a level that you can't touch it, but like, you know, it's there and you can feel it. And to hear you say that, like, no, like we all really need each other in that moment. And it's still something that's very present. And it's not something that is like overly produced and just wrapped in a package. Like here, here's this thing. Like, I don't know why it made me feel really good. Oh, good. Yeah. Well, it makes me feel, me feel really good. good when you said that. So I'm assuming that um, to get to a conductor. Yeah. It's like anything else. Like you probably have to start by just learning how to play an instrument. Right. What was, what was your instrument? Uh, horn and piano. I mean, I actually started out in clarinet in Key West and then bassoon. Cool. And uh, we moved, we had actually moved to Italy for a year. And they, you know, it's, I, I always was the one that they, if they needed an instrument learned, they would say, Sabrina, go learn this, you know. And um, so I, I got to play a lot of different instruments, but I finally just said, you know what, I, I need to just stay with the horn. Mm-hmm. And, and I started taking piano actually kind of later, you know, in high school, just because I knew I was going to be a conductor and that I would really need. You knew that? Yeah, at seventh grade. That's cool. Yeah. Well, I was inspired. I mean, I always kind of knew, everyone always knew I'd be in music. I don't know why. I mean, because there was, 
no one knew anything about how do I get into music, but I was into music since, I mean, they have a picture of me sitting at a piano and, and the orchestra laughs because I tend to do that. Sometimes I'll point at somebody like, you know, in a moment I'll point at the brass or I'll do that. And there's a photo of me one years old, not even one, I think 11 months. And I have one hand on the piano and the other hand like that. And they're like, God, you're even conducting when you were one years old. <laughs> so, you know, but seventh grade, I, it was, I had a woman, uh, band teacher, band conductor. Cool. And she was just so inspiring that I knew I was going to be a conductor. It wasn't really till probably high school that I knew I'd be, in, that there was more to music than just band, you know, just playing. Yeah. than just playing. Well, just also th that there's other things, you know, I never was exposed to orchestra or opera. And I was in Italy and I, <clears throat> I, uh, was with the, my class and we kind of, I kind of got separated from them, which isn't unusual. I, tend to get lost a lot and but anyway i ended up at this this theater and i heard music mm -hmm. and singing so i walked in and uh and this was in napoli in naples and everyone's just bawling you know it's like well you know when you're a kid and adults are bawling you're just like you know bawling, like crying like crying okay. you know you're 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 a little surprised because you think something's going on and uh and i realized and i didn't know what the opera was then i mean i can tell you what it is now because yeah. i knew but it there was a woman dying on the stage and there was this fuzzy thing that was rolling the kind of rolling and and so and she, while she was dying and you know the italians being the italians and they loved their opera they were crying at the right moment the the opera was uh, puccini's la boheme okay and me and she dies is. well she dies in the end mimi dies in the end all of puccini's women died mm -hmm. and you know she had this muff that they she had, was given because she was cold and it was rolling and you know as she was dying so that was when i realized oh my god you know i have no idea what there is out there and i think that sort of put me in the direction of figuring out what i really wanted to do in music you know as a conductor so you know it took a while it took a while for me to kind of find my way i went into did co composition and things you know just trying to get because you you really can't go into conducting until you're graduate and doctorate you know you have to master your instrument you have to master music and so i you know i was doing my horn and piano and i was doing composition but i was always trying to conduct you know i was always trying to put groups together because i wanted to conduct i wanted to um, I don't know why, except that I was, but you know, now I know why. Um, but it was just, that was what I was going to do, mm -hmm. you know? So that was sort of my path. That music teacher that you had, um, I've heard over and over again, as I think everybody has the influence of like certain teachers in their lives. And, um, we all know that things like music and even stuff like recess, you know, is like being pulled from public school systems. Definitely. I don't know as much about private schools. I mean, I'm sure there's private music schools. Right. But uh, is that something that concerns you? Yes. And, be, and, and I'll tell you that we do a lot of we do a lot of stuff for the children. We do a lot of music education and music concerts for the children. And one of the things that I've been talking about to my committees and my board is that it, I mean just taking the fact that Florida Phil went under in 2000 I said you don't what you don't understand is we've lost two at least two generations of of people that didn't get the music education of any kind you know and so when I do when I do these concerts for the kids I, you know I I feel that I need to also bring the parents i have to do things that bring the parents because i don't think the parents realize how this impacts their kids and you're right and if they saw what it was doing for their children it may it may make them be, try to become more familiar with it i mean i can tell you that in key west i've gone because i used to do all types of programs when i was when the orchestra was just down there we did all kind of summer programs and i can just i mean there's that whole generation of kids that went with me from kindergarten through 12th grade, they're out doing their dream. You know, it's, you know, when we, when I teach music and I'm talking about it to people, I'm not saying you have to be a musician, but I, I know that as a discipline, it shows you how to, first of all, be committed 
first and learn how that it's not a, it's not instant gratification, which you know we have become. Uh, that there is a process, and that if you do the process, the reward is is great because the the fact that you did that and that you know that you love what you're doing so you know and and it it enhances your life i mean the reason that people at some point in their life come back to to it and most people when i've spoken with them when they you know it's like older if they're you know they come do you know that i don't care how old they are they can be 80 they can be 60 they can be 100 they remember who the assistant conductor was of the orchestra that they got to go to that concert they remember. And so, and, you know, sometimes people, you have a life. They don't, they're not really into the cultural arts. They don't do a lot. But at a certain age, when your kids maybe have grown, people come, come back, back to right? it. And it's, and it's because they had it in their childhood. But you, you're, you've got generations of people who never had, never it. had it. And they're not going to come back to it. And, you know, the thing is, if you talk to these people who go, they're going to tell you, oh my God, it, it enhances their life. I mean, it, the, the pleasure of like yourself saying being somewhere experiencing live with other people and and you know and for the most part seeing people who are masters at what they're doing so mm. it's like watching the olympics you're seeing the best of the best you yes. know you're seeing people do it that have trained their whole life or you know have committed to being the best and and so you know and, and in many ways this is even more enhancing because it's it's a it's a whole experience and you're, it's a story it's it's really you know everything about music opera dance it's about life you know and it's it's, always about a story right yes yeah you're telling a story yes man even hearing you speak like that was bringing me back into places in my life where i can those moments that you get only every once in a while and they only last sometimes for like 30 seconds where if you're at a concert or you're listening to a song or even if i'm playing my guitar or something where you just get that funny feeling, which is, I guess, the only thing to explain is spiritual, right? Yes. Um, and I'm, I'm with you with how concerning that is to me because, uh, as a writer, I'm not by any means like uh, credentialed in the same way that you are with your art, but with, and also with my profession, which is online marketing, which I would consider myself to be an expert. There's so much buzz around the technical side of things, you know, like programming. And and I think that that stuff is very important, but I worry that within there, we lose sight of the fact that there's always an emotion involved. And without that emotion, without that story, like it doesn't matter how good you are at programming, if you can't create something that tells a story and that like expresses something, you're not going to sort of, there's, there's not going to be any connection and anything to, to be gained. And I, I think you're totally right with that, where we worry so much about um, more technical type stuff in the class, in the classroom. And we forget that arts are just as important, if not more important, because they teach you like that one intangible skill, which is relationships. Like you said, they teach you how to communicate with other people and I had a music teacher. Her name was uh, Mrs. Sinkler. And she taught me so much about it. And I haven't spoken to her, but I remember every single day going into that class. And uh, she was the one that basically introduced me to a kid named Ryan, who was the guitar player in the band that I played with for like seven years growing up. And, and that band, you know, when you're a kid, like you think this is all I ever want to do with my life. And sometimes you make it and most of the time you don't. But nonetheless those journeys and experiences i had about just playing music with them most of the time it was just in a basement well you know you should hear the joy and and i can see it in your eyes you almost like the joy that when you're talking about it and that's 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 the whole that's the whole life enhancing yeah experience that i'm talking about i mean it brings joy to you it certainly does i think it brings joy to everybody it does Mm -hmm. and and you know the thing about for me the thing about ballet or opera or symphony what i what the way that i explain it is it's is the ultimate in you know uh, composition it is the most complex it's the one that it's the it's the it's sort of like it's like the olympics it's like you have all these other things going on but that once that person reaches that stage you know this is this is the pinnacle of 
music. It's the best music ever written. It's lasted hundreds and hundreds of years, and in some cases uh. longer. And it it's 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 it has passed on throughout throughout the centuries. And that's why you know it is it is something that needs to be learned because it has a history and it grows, you know, you know, it went from the churches and, or, you know, even before that, but it went from the churches to, you know, small chambers and it grew to, to the symphony and then, you know, the opera and the ballet. I mean, these things grew out of each other and it's a history. I mean, we, when we study music, we study where it came from and how it came to be. And, and, you know, so much just as important as the music itself you're saying yeah it's about knowing but it's also just about that that, that people like myself and and any and any other musician you know we didn't we can't you can't just be a conductor i mean you can't just be a guitarist you have to learn it but it's 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 a it's an ever ending it's a never ending uh, mm. process and you really have to master your your skill to be able to play the masters and to perform the masters and to you know intellectually bring it to be to be life i mean to make it from the page that's just a bunch of notes that if you don't know what they are just looks like a bunch of scribble mm -hmm. to to life because the reality is a human being wrote it a human being was living life at the moment whether they were happy sad you know going through war i mean there's many pieces written during you know war times and you know tragedies um, or happy times, uh, and you know, is to take it off that page and not make it about that page, not make it about the the actual notes, but about what was that life at, and 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 then bringing it into our time period, into our daily life, and bring giving it to the audience so that they can feel what they need to feel at that moment. You said, talking about symphonies and ballet and opera, that it's timeless, and it was like. I think you said it was the best music that was ever written. You you really feel that passionate about that sort of genre? Well, I when I say the best it? music, it's that it's the most it's the most uh, virtuosic music. You know, it's it, I, I can as a, as a person that can read and and at, at the level I am, you know, it. In other words, someone that hasn't been trained in the same way. It's just about training. Someone that went to high school and ran in high school can't compete in the Olympics. Mm -hmm. That's all it is. It's just that, you know, that you're, you have, it takes a lifetime to train, you know, from the time you're a child to train, to, to be able to, to be able to perform this at the level that needs to be performed to, to make the kind of music it makes. And that's what I mean is that it's not a, I understand. It's, it's, it's not just on another level. It's on another level. It's, yeah. it's, it's, um, it's like becoming a doctor. You know, you can't mm -hmm. just go to four years of school and become a doctor. I mean, it's 12 years, you know, yeah. and, and, and you're still learning even after that. In fact, <clears throat> I always realized that, you know, what I got in conservatory and in university, it really didn't get used until I started using it in my, in my work and that it didn't make any sense. You know, you're just learning what they're just, you know, they're giving you to learn, but it didn't start to really sink in and and become useful until you were actually doing it and mm -hmm. and um then you realized what the education did for you but you know it, it's, you you really can't you can't as a you can't go to college you can't decide in college that you're going to be a famous violinist or play in a major orchestra and have never played violin that's what i mean you would have had by the time you're in college you should pretty much be at a certain level um or a good chance you're not going to get there because it really is, I mean, it's a lifetime achievement mm -hmm. and it takes that kind of, um, you know, when you think about it, I mean, the whole history, you know, let's think about these violins that are Stradivarius violins that are hundreds of years old from 1600s, 1700s that get better with age and they still can't figure out what it is, the oil that they've used. Well, they think they know um, that it's a certain tree that's evidently extinct. So, you know, that the things that I mean, think about an instrument, think about your guitar, mm -hmm. you know, where did that come from and how it came so that it can make the beautiful music chords? You know, how did I mean, this all came from somewhere and it all I mean, it all evolved. And when I think when I listen to the strings or when I listen to the winds or the brass and I hear these beautiful music and then how did they figure out that they can put it 
together, you know, I have, I can have as many as a hundred people and it makes a specific kind of sound, you know, that people love to hear in their ears. I mean, think about that. That's kind of a miracle. I mean, it's, it's, I know what you're saying because there's that thing that you're talking about. It doesn't matter who you are or what language you speak, or even if you like metal or pop music or whatever, when you hear that, like it hits you regardless. Um, so there was another question. I'm sorry to change no, the subject okay. so quickly. I was also very curious. And I think I asked myself this question when I saw some YouTube video of some guy training a, a whole bunch of kids without music experience, how to play. Um, it's like an Ozzy Osbourne song or something. When you actually put a piece together, do you train all the different, you know, like the brass and the woodwinds and the percussion? Do you do them all separately and then work on bringing it together? Or do you all sit in the same room and like, uh, yeah. can you explain that to sure. me? I've always been so curious. Well, about I that. mean, you know, that this is a professional orchestra. So these these people all have training. I mean, I, I don't. I would hope so. Yeah. So they're all professionals. Yeah. They've been through, you know conservatories most of them play professionally uh we come we do four rehearsals and we play the first rehearsal usually i try to run as much through all the music so they can you know listen to each other and and just you know get it in their heads and because you know i don't always play music they know i mean i i try to put modern music i try to bring you know Mer living composers but you know we do a lot of pieces that they do know um for really, when you're at this level of group, you're not, you don't have to train them to play together. You don't have to train them. They know they can play it. Um, you're you're just you're working on the music. And it's funny because I've had people come to rehearsal. They'll come to the first rehearsal, and you know, at, at intermission or something, I'll go to talk to them, and they'll they're just like, "What are you rehearsing? I mean, it sounded perfect." Yeah. And I said, "Okay, I'm gonna make a challenge for you. Come to the first rehearsal, come to one other, and then come." to the concert you know and or come to the dress rehearsal but try to make at least one at least two rehearsals and um so they did and at at, at the end of the dress rehearsal they they really were so th excited because they heard the difference sure they 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 just like oh i can't believe how i thought it was so perfect in the first rehearsal yeah. and they got it they said you're not working on getting them playing together they can play together it's it's about making the piece come alive as an as an entity as its own entity and um and they got it and that that made their experience in the concert hall even that more much higher you know mm -hmm. i always tell people you should listen to the music before if you don't know the piece you should listen to it before you come because i always i always relate it to when i'm sitting in my car if i'm listening to the radio and i hear a new song and i go oh, okay i kind of like that you know but then i've heard it three times now and of course i like it a little more but by that fifth or sixth time i know the words and i'm sitting in my car I'm just singing, singing it, it. Yeah. and you know the in the um experience of that song is much better because i know it, i know and i i can anticipate what's coming that's cool. So, and I feel like it's the same thing. People that that know Beethoven or Berlioz or Mozart or Shostakovich, they know their music are going to experience it differently than people that aren't as familiar. And for me, uh, you know, what a lot of conductors are doing nowadays, not all, but a lot, is that we talk to the audience before we do the piece and um, really? tell them a little bit so so they can connect to me so they know what I'm thinking about the piece. They know how I'm feeling about the piece, but they're also knowing what to listen for. And I've even this last concert, I did demonstrations with the orchestra. They played specific places. And, you know, with the, the Symphony Fantastique, it's about this young musician who, you know, feeds himself opium because he's, you know, he's in despair because his loved, his loved one has, you know, mm -hmm. doesn't uh, love him. And it's it, she has it's her specific theme, and it just goes through five movements of all these different experiences that he's having. But in the middle of it, it's it's he's she keeps coming in, and it's just her particular theme. And you know he dreams he murders her, and so he's got to ha have his head cut off. And then the funeral, which is the ending, it's you know it's a funeral with ghosts and and um, witches, and 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 it's all of these wonderful colors that Berlioz puts into this music and you know i 
I made, they did those demonstrations, made sure they knew what they call it, uh, an idea fixed, a fixed idea, which is just, it was the beloved theme and how he could be in a swirl of something, just all this music just coming, coming, coming at you. And all of a sudden it just stops. And then you hear her theme and that's how she was, you know, it was about her just, she kept infiltrating his mind. You know, he was just so devastated over her. Um, and it's a really cool, it's just a cool. Symphony. Yeah. I would appreciate that because I think for most people, they would hear it and you wonder what was the person thinking when they wrote this, exactly. you know, and uh, some, some music obviously has words, but most of the time in symphony, there's not, I think there's sometimes singers. Yeah. Symphony, yeah. I right? mean, you can do things with songs. Yes, definitely. Yeah. But even still to, to know that there's that story and then to be able to like identify the changes in tempo and the music or I don't know the, what would you say just the volume or something and to know that like this is the part of the story that's coming up i think that's really cool i would yeah people really love it that. they actually love it and because they said they were able to follow yeah and, exactly and i mean that's part of the experience is knowing why you know knowing why that thing kept coming back i mean if i didn't explain that thing to people even people that heard it i mean even people that heard it said you know i've heard this piece for years and it always felt a little disjointed i never understood it and then you explained it and it was like oh that that's the woman coming into his yeah mind. yeah and just that the, the 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 different sounds you know what what was the story you know everybody knew it was a it was some kind of crazy story and that there were ghosts and goblins and all of that but they didn't really understand that it was you know it was somebody's imagination a young you know this young musician's imagination and this, it was basically, you know, Leonard Bernstein called it a psychedelic symphony. It was basically an opium trip. He, wow. he, he, oh, he didn't, it was like Alice in Wonderland. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. And, you know, that it, I mean, barely, I was, I mean, we all, you know, was very, um, very um, emotional. And at, at no point did anyone ever think he took opium. I mean, he, he wrote this. He was only 26 years old when he wrote this fantastic piece. Um, but you know, we certainly felt like he was the person he was speaking about, you know, mm. and um, but he made it this kind of uh psychedelic symphony. But it, it's an incredible piece, it was actually one of the pieces I hadn't had the opportunity to do, it's been on my bucket list list for years, so I was pretty happy to get to what's it called again? Berlioz Hector Berlioz Symphony Fantastique. Yeah, I'm just gonna put it in the notes. Yeah, you should go listen to it, go read I'm about it, to. and then that'll it'll. You know, you can find the program notes to it anywhere. And um, it's, a, it's a great piece. And I was telling the audience, I said, you, you know, I, I swear all Halloween music came from this piece from this because piece, it right? just it's I mean, it's how Halloween. long is it? About 40 minutes, a little over 40 minutes. 26 years old and you wrote a 40 minute. I think it's like a little more than 40. It was 40 something like depending on how fast you took everything. But it could be oh up to 45 gosh. minutes. Yeah. Yeah. Um. Berlioz, well, his music is, I mean, his songs, his his music is just gorgeous. His, what time period was he from? He, well, he wrote that in 1830. He wrote that three years after Beethoven died. So he was he was really the cusp of the, he was the beginning and, and really took the romantic period where, you know, everything wasn't had to be a specific technic, technical way to yes. write it. That, that, that he took it to another place where, there, you know, there, it's sort of like we call a tone poem. Um, where there's a story and that the, you know, that it was sort of taboo to, to have it be a story. The music should just be the music. Um, but the romantic period was more, you know, that they were expressing, it was okay to express yourself and to, you know, to be happy or to be sad or to be in despair in your music to, ex you know, to explore your emotions in the music. So I, I think that, I, I mean, I think he took it from A to, to Z with this one piece Real and it was only three years after beethoven's death and you know everyone in between and really very few did anything like that you know but in during the romantic period who is um i guess hero might be the word when it comes to composers or musicians that have written amazing stuff who's the one that you've always been like wow this is well i'm this a, is genius i i love beethoven but if i were to say somebody i admired would probably be Shostakovich because he was writing during the Stalin regime mm. and he had many, many friends, artists, musicians that, you know, they came and took him in the middle of the night sure. and never saw them again. And Shostakovich could have gotten out. He could have left um, and he stayed and he was, you know, he was sort of this mealy, you know, just kind of scared little man 
but he was brave in his music and yeah. and for some reason Stalin took a liking to him or just um and you know you he wrote music they there was a there was a saying in Russian that's you know when you smile somebody in somebody's face you smile then you spit and it was sort of that he would write this music for the for the for the common folk these symphonies and you know there would be all the regime you know all the regime sitting up in the front and they would get up thinking it was this grand you know military type piece and everyone else understood that you know he smiled and then spit that you know they thought one thing but they the, the common folk knew he was speaking to them through through fooling what do you think he was saying that he was saying that that this this so you're called arms it was no he was telling he was he was saying what it was that was happening mm. that you know one of the things in the symphony um in the end of the fifth symphony is that he explained at one time that was this that because you hear this 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 sort of like hitting that and uh it's it's controversy of whether that's really done on um fast or if it's done really slow um i've and i was in i was in italy studying with uh, gennady rostovinsky and asked him about it and um the guy was just his eyes were empty um but the the the, the reality is is that it was explained in one way that you know he it would, when it was being done fast it was sort of like here here's your bombastic you know military thing you know let's let's do it real quick let's and get, get out of the way because it means nothing to the people yeah. but that that continuous you know, da, 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 you know like just pounding uh Shostakovich sort of said it's like somebody hitting you in the back of the head with the hammer goes i will be happy i will be happy i will be happy <laughs> you know his music i mean his seventh symphony is about the war his music so i mean there's so many great pieces that i love and i i mean i yeah but you but, can tell that guy really speaks to you yeah i just i i loved his um his bravery mm -hmm. and yet he you would never look at this man and think he was brave because he was scared you know he he had his suitcase under his bed ready to run if he thought they were coming for him i mean so he knew he was he knew he was writing pieces that could get him in trouble um and he had written a fourth symphony which stalin had condemned uh and so when he wrote this fifth symphony this was sort of okay is he getting back in the favor of stalin and of course stalin and them believed that this was for them and the people knew differently that is really cool it's so there's a like a weird juxtaposition yeah. between it uh, yeah you have to read you have to read behind the music yeah. mm -hmm. so um so one last thing okay when you talked about the bravery I've said a lot in my writing that uh, it takes a lot of bravery just to simply publish your work in the first place, because anytime you do that, you're like exposing yourself in a way. Um, I think publishing music is very, very similar because there's never like a right way or a wrong way. I mean, I guess when it comes to the technical standpoint, like there probably is, um, but even that can be observed from a lot of different viewpoints, right? What what is it do you think is next for you? I mean, you said that the what do you call it seasons with the symphony. You said the last show was over. Are you just well for the masterworks? No, I mean just for the masterworks. I mean okay. we have a couple things in the June um, that were a couple performances. We do uh, chamber music, but you know for me, I mean as far as just the next thing is I'm I you know I'm at the stage where I I'm just trying to do new things. So for instance, we're we're, we're going to pre present Porgy and Bess, which to me is an iconic opera, American opera, which, you know, has not been done much here in like the last 10 or 12 years. I don't know. I've been up here for a while. I mean, it hasn't been performed, not the opera. But, you know, the sets, building sets, you know, opera is a very expensive uh, undertaking. So I didn't know that. Uh, uh, so something, you know, something that uh i want to do with that is i'm you know there's not even really it's not music but is because it, the sets are so expensive you know and i've been going to other operas and you know you, the sets aren't as grand as they used to be because the operas just can't afford it is that i want to introduce the video mapping to 
this oh. opera. You know, so when on when they're on the beach, they're sitting on the beach when they have a scene in the Porgy and Bess where they're at the beach because this yeah. is in Charleston, South Carolina. You know, with the video mapping, you know, as they're walking on the sand, you don't you have know, to build a whole set. Don't have to build a set. Yeah, I mean, but but great. we've already started on the building the video. You know, the video because it's it takes a you know about a year to to do that. You know, it it so when they're walking on the sand, you know, the, the sand will move like if they're walking on it. They're in the walking on the water. You know, they're kicking the water. You know, it that looks so like cool. you're there. The Rockettes yeah. did that. I went and saw the Rockettes last year, and they had something very similar. Where oh. The whole entire thing was video mapped. What was the show? The cat. The Rockettes. The Rockettes. Right. Yeah. You see it. I've Broadway. seen it dance, and that dance has done it. I haven't. I I haven't seen it done in opera. So I'm I'm hoping that we're doing something sort of revolutionary. You know, I I this year we did a concert with flamenco, which people absolutely loved. We did a, a concert with the Martha Graham Dance Company. So, um, you know, the I always say orchestra is always to me the the leading arm in a community because. Orchestra can be can play on its own, but opera needs orchestra, dance needs orchestra, ballet needs orchestra, musicals need orchestra. Yeah. Um, you know, it's so like the nucleus. Yes, it is, and mm -hmm. and we should be the leaders in the in the education component too, because I think you know with opera, dance, you know, I think it's more expensive. It's 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 a harder burden, and not that they don't, because I know that. The opera does music ed. I know that the ballet does education. The ballets, Miami City Ballet, they have their you know ballet school and things like that. So, I think everyone is trying their best. Uh, these organizations to to bring this. To yeah, the but it's good to hear you kind of take that initiative, almost like the burden of responsibility. Like, well, I just think we can do it. I think that we can do it. We can do more with the same amount of money. Yeah. That's what, you know, there's involved an orchestra, involved singers, involves maybe moving sets. So we can do a little more. But it's just always been that way. Orchestras, it mm -hmm. starts with the orchestra, I think. And, you know, I've always said if I were going to introduce opera, I would always I would introduce the marriage of Figaro because I it's such a it's such a fun story. Um and I just went and saw it in uh in a, at the Kravis Center, the Palm Beach Opera did it, and I just love Mozart's operas because also the 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 singing. I mean, when he he puts he nobody puts duets, trios, quartets, sectets, octets. Mm -hmm. I mean, he does this with the vo vocals, and it's absolutely gorgeous. And but it's also he he you know in his he was sort of ahead of his time. I mean, you know he the plot is about. I mean, they're talking about women should stick up for women. You know, these all the things are going on and the women are protecting each other, you know, and women are, they're saying, you know, women have to protect each other. They're sort of a little, it's a little more, I mean, it's almost like he's talking about equality for women, you know, and this is done in the 1700s, late 1700s. So, uh, you know, I appreciate Mozart's uh, operas. I love his music and his, his, his melodies are just gorgeous. Is... Is being a woman conductor um, a challenge? Is it like a male-dominated industry? Is it something that you pride yourself on, or do you think it's just sort of you're the person for the job, so let's just act accordingly? Well, it's yeah. Unfortunately, that's not the case. I, it's amazing because it is the one part of of uh, the symphony world that hasn't caught up. You know, when uh, I'm surprised to hear that. Yeah, it's uh, when a violin something as liberal. I mean, it's called the liberal arts, right? <laughs> exactly. But but it's not the liberal arts who who chooses, you know, it's usually sure. business people choose the conductor, the, the board. And um, and it's just and I, it's changing. Don't get me wrong. And mm -hmm. there's more women out there. But, you know, when you audition for an orchestra job, you audition behind a screen. So they have no idea. They even make if you come with heels or certain kind of shoes, they make you take them off and walk. So in they your, can't hear. They it? don't know if it's a woman or wow. even though I honestly don't think i i honestly don't think that i that there is that there would be that you know bias even if they weren't behind a screen but i think it's good for the musician because it's 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 hard you know walking in you have to play and, and when you're auditioning i mean you're going up you could be going up against hundreds of people so basically the first few rounds you're based on how perfect you play so if you don't have to have people staring at you you know and you're behind a screen you can sort of get in your own little my you know you're in your own little space and just play it be you know it's when you get with the conductor at the it's if you get to the finals then it's it's not behind a screen and it really comes down to the conductor you know i always say to people that don't think you weren't 
good enough or don't think you weren't maybe even the best. It all comes down to what I hear, mm -hmm. what I need, you know, who has the sound that I think I can work with. Because, you know, by the time you get to semifinals or finals, any of those people probably They're can get They're all experts. Them. Right. Absolutely. And, and I mean, and, you know, so it's just really about personal taste. And, you know, I always, I've, I've seen people get very discouraged that I know, you know, and that they've gotten to so many finals. And I just say, don't stop because there's going to be that one that you're their flavor yeah and it don't take it. it personal because i mean i've you know i've take i've listened to people who others might not think you know why did you pick that person and it's like because they get me you know mm -hmm. i feel like they're they're the way that they communicate the music is similar to me and that's really the only way that you can decide because other than that they're all perfect it's like i can take you all but i have to speak you know there may be only one opening so i think that um Anyway, that's that's uh, I don't know how we got to that, but anyway, that's, I was talking about being oh, a about, yeah, so there. it's not like that for women, and uh, we're still not near you know, the um, amount of women conductors that are out there are not nearly representative up in the uh, bigger orchestras, and it, it just always amazes me when people come up to me and just go, especially women, and especially women that are you know older that are thrilled and just i've never seen a woman oh my god you know just i'm so thrilled and you're so passionate and you're so this and you're that that you know they're all of a sudden their whole experience with symphony has changed because they feel represented you know because they they've been and it's always men does that mean something to you oh yeah but it, it also makes me unhappy but it has to be that, that way. It's that way because sure. the, some of these people, you know, they've gone to concerts all their lives and they still go, you know, with their snowbirds. So they may, if they're, if they're a snowbird, they may go uh, home and go to concerts and they're still not seeing women represented as much as the, the men. And it's just ridiculous. But, you know, we can just keep trying. That's all you can it's do. Really and hope people, do, right? people realize that it's. I'm sure that you are a wonderful representation. Um, I'm sure even just the conversation with you, you're, I'm sure you're really good at your job. You. <laughs> you know? I hope so. Um, I mean, Hey, thank you so much for coming to talk to me. I was actually really nervous beforehand because yeah. like I said, this is the first time I did a podcast with someone that like I never really met before. Um, and I, I really, really thank you for being so open with, uh, just your music and your art and teaching me all these things. I can't wait to Google all these people okay. now. Yeah. I, one last thing where if somebody's interested in seeing you if somebody's interested in in the orchestra is there like a website how can they find you when's the next show that yeah. you have let me know all that stuff okay well, uh, well our website is southfloridasymphony.org cool i have that one yeah and you know we do have some concerts we have we're doing a concert with uh, flamenco dancers uh sudi garrido flamenco dance theater uh, we're doing Elmore Bruhol. We're going to do something uh, very different. Do you know who Derek Smalls is in Spinal no. Tap? Oh, I know Spinal Tap. Well, we're doing a of concert course. with them at the Broward Center. That's awesome. This June, yeah. It's funny because I, I wasn't really sure that that was going to be so popular. And more people have liked that on the Facebook. We're like, and I'm like, I guess they know who this guy is. You mm -hmm. know, he's kind of has his own little cult. But we're doing some fun stuff. We also do, um, we haven't set the dates, but we'll be doing chamber concerts all around. Um, this summer, but um, they, they can get uh, subscriptions for next. So you guys year. are busy. Oh yeah, it's it's year round. Cool. SouthFloridaSymphony.org. I will link that in the show notes. Thank you. Um, once again, thank you so much. Thank you. For, it's a pleasure meeting you. You're yeah, very likewise. open. You have a great soul. So thank cool. you. Cool. That's good to hear. Thank, thank you. you so much, everybody, for listening to the podcast. Appreciate you guys. Thank you so much once again. Thank Talk you. to you next week.